for those of you who may not know, this is my friend Steve Curry. Uh, obviously, he plays guitar. <laughs> I'm honored to be here today and uh, help <laughs> just pass the word and the message <laughs> of my Lord <laughs> and the ability to do it and the physical everything. Just I'm so grateful to be here. Amen. Thank you, guys. Amen. <clears throat> this song is... Uh, Powerful, every means everything's powerful, you know, when it comes to the word. Uh, please don't take it wrong. <laughs> and it's called Drifting Too Far From The Shore. Out on the perilous deep Where danger silently storms so violently sweep you're drifting too far from the shore you're drifting too far from the shore you're drifting too far from the shore come to Jesus today let him show you the way gratitude to Steve not only did he come sing today uh, he operated the bucket truck and got up in the bucket himself and helped repair our sign yesterday out in the cold and everything I'm glad we still have some young men around here that can do that kind of stuff uh, if you rode by the church and uh, happen to see folks working on the sign Steve and Tommy and Richard, all were uh, engaged in that, and uh, we're thankful to report to you. It, it's working, and uh, we're thankful. If you have your Bibles and you'd like to follow along, turn with me to the Old Testament book of Joshua, the sixth book in the Bible, the book of Joshua, the last chapter in the book of Joshua, uh, Joshua chapter 24. I'm going to share with you some very familiar Scripture, uh, if you've been in church for a while, I'm sure that you, you know the, bra uh, the brave proclamation uh, that Joshua made uh, in Joshua chapter 24. And uh, so as, as we are, uh, are thinking about that, I would like for us to, to think about how did Joshua, uh, how was he able to make such a proclamation? 
uh, and the proclamation is, of course, uh, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is the proclamation that he made. Uh, in that statement, you can see many things, but uh, as God began to work on me uh, with the sermon for today, uh, the title of the sermon is How to Stay Committed in 2021. How to Stay Committed in this new year. Uh, thank you folks uh, that have uh, continued uh, to gather together in corporate worship. Now, I'm not saying anything uh, negative to, to folks that, that are not gathering here with us uh, in the building. If you have remained faithful to the Lord and uh, tuning in and uh, serving Him, then I want to commend you as well. Uh, but there's something about corporate worship uh, coming together. As I mentioned earlier, Jesus said where two or three would gather together in my name, there am I in the midst. Amen. When we gather together in the name of Jesus, he promises to be there. Amen. Amen? Uh, the church of St. Mattress does not hold that promise. Uh, it, sounds, it sounds a little humorous, uh, but I'm just telling you, I've talked to folks over the years and that's where they, uh, where do you attend? Where do you serve? Uh, I, I go to the church of St. Mattress. Uh, well, Jesus' promise is not necessarily for you. Well, preacher, he said he'd never leave me or forsake me. That's absolutely correct. It is correct. But why not come on in and, and gain the promise that Christ said, I promise I'll be there. Right? He's promised. All right, so enough of that. Please stand, uh, unless you're driving down the road, uh, uh, please stand with me as we, we uh, look into the Word of God here. Uh, Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Joshua is 110 years old, and he is making his last proclamation over the children of Israel. He's getting ready to go by the way of the grave, and he is leaving uh, the children of Israel uh, to uh, serve the Lord. And he is commending them and he is challenging them in the days and weeks and months ahead. Keep your eyes fixed on Christ and serve him. Serve him. That is his leaving words to the children of Israel. He has been their judge or ruler ever since Moses uh, died, went on the top of Mount Nebo before they even entered into the promised land. And um, uh, Joshua was somewhere between 68 and 78 years old whenever the children of Israel uh, crossed into the promised land. So he had been their leader for a number of years. And as he's getting ready to pass away, these are his words that he is leaving uh, with the children of Israel. Verse 14 says, Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and in truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river. And that word river could also be translated flood. Uh, before Noah, uh, the gods that they served back then, uh, Joshua said, put them away. And put away the gods that you served when you were in Egypt. He says, serve the Lord. Verse 15, he says this. If it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, if it's wrong, if you, know, if you feel that it's wrong and evil to serve God, he says do this. Choose for yourselves this day who you'll serve. Whether the gods which your fathers served which were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose lands you're dwelling. Uh, but as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Amen? So he says, make up your mind uh, who you're going to serve and serve them. Don't be wishy-washy about this thing. Don't try to uh, straddle the fence, so to speak. He said, make up your mind who you're going to serve and serve him and give him all your heart and all your service. Amen? Because whoever God that you're going to serve, he's worthy of that. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time we get to spend together uh, in the house of God. 
in the presence of God with the people of God. I pray that your Holy Spirit would move upon us in a mighty way this morning. I pray that you would anoint me and help me to speak the words that are only pleasing in your sight. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that the word as it goes forward, it will find its place in our hearts to cause us to, to want to be more like Jesus uh, as we leave this place in a little while than what we were when we came. Thank you, Lord, for being so good. In your name, amen. You may be seated. Three things I'd like to share with you, uh, according to Joshua 24, that we need to do or we must do in order to stay committed and live the life that God is pleased with in this upcoming year. How many people can say throughout 2020, my life was a steady here? for the service and the worship of God. I never had any downtime. I never had any slips or sin. I never let any sin invade my life. I never uh, at any time in my life in 2020 turned my back on the Lord or, uh, or any of those things. I'm now, I can say through 2020, I have kept my eyes totally fixed on him and I walked that higher plane this entire year. I'd say if you're like me, you could say my life throughout 2020 had a lot of ups and downs. There were times I could say I was very strong in Christ and our fellowship was very strong and I can say there were times in my life that I took my eyes off of him and like Simon Peter, as I started walking on the water, I took my eyes off of him and I began to sink. And sometimes I even let the enemy tell me that I would surely fail. But I'm still standing. Amen. And you're still here. So praise the Lord. Amen. So how can we be more successful this year? How can we be? How can we stand and be bold like Joshua was who said, I don't know what you folks are going to do. But I can tell you what I'm going to do and what my household is going to do. We are going to serve the Lord. Amen? We're going to make up my, my, our mind. We're going to fix our eyes on the prize. And we are going to march forward for the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Amen. We can do that. It is not an impossible task uh, of serving the Lord uh, throughout this new year. So there's three things I'd like to share with you uh, throughout the 24th chapter of the book of Joshua that we need to do and we must do to, in order to stay committed. At the end of 2021, if we're still walking on this earth, that we can say, I began the year in Christ and I'm finishing the year strong. If we keep these things in our mind and we put these to practice, then I promise we can stand at the end of uh, 2021 and boldly proclaim, like Joshua did, we serve the Lord. Amen? Do you want to do that? I truly believe you do. I don't believe any of us want our lives to be like a roller coaster. I believe all of us would love to have our life actually going this way, more and more like Jesus each and every day, every week, every month, and every year. Amen? Three things I'd like to share with you, quick, fast, and in a hurry. If you amen, you praise the Lord, you shout, raise your hand, it knocks a little bit of time off the service. So I'm going to encourage you to participate and get in the service this morning. If you're watching online and you want to praise the Lord along with us, you put it in the comment section and Richard will raise his hand for you. Amen. If you're getting tired and uh, the dinner is getting ready to burn on the stove and you're wanting us to hurry and get done, I, I encourage you to fill the comment section up on Facebook and Richard will raise his hand every time you do and uh, I'll still preach as long as I intended to to start with. First thing we need to do is remember. One of the main reasons that we easily, uh, that we get defeated so easy is because we forget way too easy. We forget way too easy. I'll give you an example really quick. It's an Old Testament example. Uh, the children of Israel. Can you imagine living as a, a Jewish person in Egypt during the time of Moses as they were getting ready to leave, heading towards the promised land. God sent the great man of God, 
Moses in their midst, who was also called the friend of God. I mean, I think that's pretty cool myself. The Bible says over in the, uh, uh, I think it's the last chapter of Deuteronomy, that Moses talked to God face to face. That's who God sent into the, the midst of, of Egypt to deliver the nation of Israel out of Egypt. And so uh, can you imagine living during that period of time in the land of Goshen, you being a Jewish person? Let's just use our imaginations for a few minutes. And Moses, uh, God working through Moses, these mighty miracles, these sending these ten plagues upon the nation of Egypt before they allowed or paid the Jewish people to leave. Can you imagine waking up one morning and looking out past the land of Goshen and seeing these different plagues taking place, seeing the mighty hand of God work, water turn to blood. Can you imagine that? Knowing about the flies and the locusts and all these things, the darkness. Can you imagine living in such a time and watching the hand of God working all these mighty miracles? Well, the children of Israel was witnesses to all those. And I'm sure many of us will say, you know, if I was one of them, I could, I could live on that. Well, we see just as mighty miracles today. Uh, that last song we sung, I see the evidence of God's goodness all over my life. There's not a, a period of time I can look back over my life and not see where the hand of God was moving and working and, and all those things that he did, uh, he's done for me and is doing for me. Amen? So we see those mir same miracles today if we'll just open up our spiritual eyes and watch God work. But the children of Israel watched God work those ten mighty plagues. Do you know how long it took them to forget? After God delivered them out of Egypt, they're headed towards the promised land. Do you know how many days journey? I'm not saying weeks. Do you know how many days journey they got out uh, of, uh, after they got out of Egypt. And now they're not going with their pockets empty either. The, the Egyptians paid them to leave. They didn't just say, okay, you can go now. They paid them to leave. They went with their pockets full. Can you imagine? And so does anybody know how long did it take them for, to forget? In days. Three. They were out in the, uh, they had left Egypt and they were only out uh, uh, in the wilderness for three days and they began to complain. Why did they complain? Well, they forgot about the goodness of God. Amen. You want to know what's wrong with America? We are unthankful. Amen. Romans chapter 1 will tell us, if you read that, will tell you what is all the wrong that's in our country. First, and it starts off by Christians being unthankful. When we're unthankful, then it shows to our children that we're not thankful. It shows to our communities that we're not thankful. Husbands, dads, if you're not thankful, then your wife, your children will not be thankful. Wives, Mothers, if you're not thankful to the Lord, then your kids and your husband and everyone else will know that you're not thankful. And we need to be thankful in the small things. And then God will allow us to be thankful in the big things. Amen? Amen. So they had forgot. And by them forgetting, instead of being thankful, that they, hey, we're out of Egypt. My back, the, the stripes on my back are starting to heal where the taskmasters were beating me and making me uh, make those bricks and all those things that they were having to do. Three days' journey out in the, uh, after they left Egypt, they started complaining. Oh, I wish we was back in Egypt. And how quickly they forgot all the bad stuff and all the things that God had delivered them from. Today, if we are being unthankful, man, I encourage you to challenge or to, uh, to review in your mind, what are you, what's going on in there? Are you thinking about all the stuff you don't have rather than the things that God has blessed you with? Amen? Whenever I begin to feel unthankful 
it's because Satan has got me blinded to the things that I do have, and I start thinking about the stuff that I don't have. I don't live, I don't have a four-car garage like so-and-so has. I'm not driving the big fancy automobile, and I don't have this or that or the other thing. I can't go here, and I can't do this, and I can't do that, and I wish I was this, and I wish I was that. Is that you? This very day? Have you got your mind and your eyes fixed on what you don't have rather than what you do have? Amen? I, I've heard it said, and I've even said it myself, if God never blessed me again, He's, over, he's already over-blessed me. By giving me the precious gift of salvation, He never has to bless me ever again. And I can honestly say I'm overly blessed today. Amen? But you know what God says? He will bless us. Amen? It's His good pleasure to bless His kids. Amen? Uh, we, we need to remember, the children of Israel only three days out in the desert, and they were already complaining. Three days is all it took. Three days they had forgot about the ten plagues and the awesome uh, power that was on full display for every one of them to witness. But in three days... There they were. And sadly to say, it doesn't even take us three days sometimes. Amen? God can pour out his grace and mercy upon us one day, and the next day we're already complaining about something else. Joshua 24, 13, listen to what. Uh, first of all, we need to remember God's plan for us. In Joshua 24, 13, the Bible says, I've given you a land for which you did not labor. Cities which you did not build, you dwell in them, and you eat of the vineyards and the olive groves that you didn't plant. Here at this point in time in the book of Joshua, they had already uh, went into the promised land and conquered it. They didn't have to build any of the cities that they were living in. The heathen had already built all of those. They didn't have to plant any groves or do anything. They went right into the cities that they were living in presently. God gave it to them. We need to remember God's plan for us. Amen? Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13, the Bible says this, For I know the thoughts or the plans that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. We need to remember that. God's plan for us always is to give us a future and a hope. Verse 12 says, Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me, and you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. God's plan for us is always good. Why, is his, why can you say that, preacher? Because God is always good. His character is good. It may not appear to good, uh, it may not appear that good on the onset, but I guarantee you, God's plan is always good. You know, the Bible says the steps of a good man or a good woman are ordered by the Lord. Amen. If you're walking uprightly for, for the Lord, I promise you God's plan for you is good and it will produce good. You may have to go through some things that you don't feel like are good to get to the good, but I promise you God's plan for you is always good and the end result is going to be good. Amen. So we need to remember His plan for our life Next of all, we need to remember his power. We're not kept by the hand of some weakling, but we're kept by the power of the Almighty, amen? Even when it feels like we might lose, God has a way of turning short sure defeat into victory. There are story after story found in Scripture where it seemed like the children of God were facing short sure defeat, but God turned it around and gave them victory through it. The God we serve created the heavens and the earth by merely speaking a word. Amen? Can you imagine the awesome power that God possesses that he just spoke the word and the heavens and the earth were created? The God we serve works miracle after miracle in our midst and he's not lost any power. He is the same. We need to remember the power of God. Joshua, Joshua rehearses to the children of Israel uh, the power of God. 
Joshua 24, 6 and 7 says this, Then I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. What sea? The Red Sea, that is. Y'all remember the Red Sea crossing? And the Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and horsemen uh, to the sea. So they cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. Then he brought the sea upon them and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt. Then you dwelt in the wilderness a long time. God rehearsed uh, through the mouth of Joshua the power that he possesses. He said, remember this story? Now, uh, you may have forgotten about the ten plagues I sent on Egypt. But none of you should ever forget what I did at the Red Sea. Here comes Pharaoh bearing down with all of his armies and all of his might. I'm going to capture them and I'm going to return them back to Egypt or I'm going to kill them one. God put darkness in between the children of Israel and the children of Egypt so they couldn't pass. And then God opened the Red Sea and they crossed by on dry ground. Now friends, I want to tell you what a miracle that was in, in itself. And I'm not going to get into all that. But God is reminding them the awesome power that he possessed that he opened up the Red Sea and allow them to cross over. Then the lost people tried to go the same way. The Egyptians represents the sinner apart from Christ. Well, we're going to go too. Doesn't everybody think they're going to go to heaven? Yeah. The Bible says, Jesus said, I am the way, which means one way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. But the Egyptians tried to go and continue pursuing them through the Red Sea, and God says, he covered it right up. John 10, 28 through 30, Jesus says this, And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. That's awesome power of God. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. Isn't that wonderful to know we have security in Christ because there is none greater, there is none higher, there is none mightier than my Jesus. Amen? He said, my father who has given them, given them, which is us, to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. The awesome power that Jesus Christ possesses is found also in Revelation 1.18 and in what comfort that is. I am he who lives and was dead and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of death and hell. Jesus alone possesses those keys. Amen. Nobody can snatch them. They belong to him. Amen. First of all, we need to remember. Second of all, we need to remember to repent. That is not very popular preaching in our day because nobody seemingly wants to do it. What is repentance? What is it? What does that mean? Most people believe, and the average church believes it means to say, God, I'm sorry, and then go on about your merry way. Is that your belief? Is that what you believe repentance actually means? Well, that's not the scriptural word for repentance. There are two things that the Bible requires out of the, the Christian and out of the sinner that we should do, the, the sinner to, to be placed into God's family, you're required to confess and repent. But Christians, after we become part of the family of God, whenever we sin, whenever we commit iniquity, well, I don't think Christians do that. Huh. Well, you've not looked in a mirror lately, and you don't have to look no further than up here to know that there is sin in the hearts and lives of every one of us. Whenever we do, commit sin as a Christian and uh, uh, what, what are we to do then whenever we sin? What, what are, are, is a Christian to do? Are we to just na kneel down and uh, cry a few crocodile tears and say, God, I'm sorry and uh, please forgive me and get up and go back to your seat and then, then go do what you was doing to start with that made you feel so bad? Is that what we're to do? Uh, to remain strong, to be that, that bold Christian at the end of 2021 whenever you do sin. You know, John says, 
uh, my, my fellow believers or my little children, I write unto you that you sin not. But if you do sin, I want you to know we have an advocate with the Father. 1 John 1, 9 says that, that if we will confess our sin, that he is faithful and just. So there's two things that, that travel hand in hand uh, and throughout our lifetime whenever we do sin that we, we are commanded to do. One of the reasons that, that, that there are so many church members that are caught up in doing the same old thing over and over and over, is this you? Are you wore out, you sick and tired of committing the same sin over and over? Well, I confess, preacher, I go to the altar and I, I confess and I, I ask God to forgive me over and over and over and over and this and that and all the other, but I still find myself doing it over again. May I, may I suggest to you that, that, uh, that the reason that this is happening is because you've not exercised full repentance. You may have confessed. Confession means to agree with God that what you, you were done and convicted of uh, is sin in his sight, that it's horrendous, it's terrible. That's con when we confess, God, I'm sorry, I have sinned in your sight. That's what confession is and truly mean it. But repentance is something altogether different. But it's confession's traveling partner. If you have godly sorrow of your sin, when you confess it, the Bible says we need to take the next step. And I want to tell you, we're not powerful enough within our own self to be able to accomplish what Scripture says we're to do. It takes the mighty hand of God working in and through our lives to be able to truly repent from what sin that we're engaged in. No, I don't know who I'm speaking to that may be in this audience or watching over the internet, but friend, I'm going to tell you, if you belong to Christ and you're committing the same sin over and over and over, I guarantee you, you're sick of it. You're tired of it. And you don't want to do it anymore. So may I encourage you to take the next step and allow God to do what he wants to do in your life. He wouldn't convict you of it to start with if it wasn't repulsive to him. Amen? If it wasn't no good for you, he wouldn't convict you of that. But if he has and is convicting you of sin, then friend, I want to tell you that there is hope for us. Amen? Amen? There is hope for each of us. Confession and repentance are traveling partners. We must have confession before repentance. Think about that. We have to have true confession before, uh, before uh, repentance takes place. A lot of people aren't godly sorrowful whenever they're caught up in sin. They're just sorry that they got caught up with. You ever been sorry that you got caught? Have you? How many speeders are in the, in the crowd today? Yeah. How many people got pulled over by a patrolman? Were you intentionally doing what you were doing? I mean, sometimes that, I, I did get pulled over one time, I, I'll be honest with you, that, that I wasn't paying attention, and uh, I got pulled over. I was following two other cars, but the patrolman, uh, the, ta the city cop, chose to pull me over. And uh, really, he, he asked me, do you know how fast you was going? I said, no, I really don't. Uh, the speed limit had changed, we just didn't change along with it. And he knew it was a sort of a speed trap. But nevertheless, I was guilty of breaking the law. But there have been times that I've got, got, got pulled over. I was speeding. And I wasn't a bit sorry of it. Am I talking to somebody else? Yeah. Got pulled over. You're speeding. You know how fast you're going? Yep. And I'm sorry. I said, I said the words, but I really wasn't. The most notable story I can tell you, and I'm gonna, I'll, I promise I'll, uh, I'll go through this. And I, I'm, I'm really, some of you may have heard me say this before, but if my three sisters are watching, and I know at least a couple of them are, you guys are familiar with the story of the calf. Uh, my cousin and I was probably 12, 14 years old. My dad had a, had a baby calf down in the barn. He had it in the stall. And uh, he and I were bored. And uh, we decided we was going to play rodeo. Yeah. And man, was that fun. One of us would get on that calf's back, and we'd ride that sucker till he'd throw us off or beat us against the wall and bruise us and skin us and 
bleeding and everything else. And my baby sister, Anita, I, she went and told Dad. Yeah. yeah, that was the worst beating I ever got. I told Dad I was sorry. I confessed to him many, many, many years later after his strength was, was fading. I didn't figure he could get up out of the chair fast as I could get out the door. I confessed to him. I said, Dad, you remember me riding that calf and you, you put the beating on me? He, he was afraid he was going to kill the calf. If he knew the, the enthusiasm that calf had, he, he would have known that calf was in no danger of me and, me and my cousin hurting him. But he was afraid he was going to hurt, break that calf's back was his own words. And, uh, but we didn't. Calf come through unscathed, me and my cousin just beat and bruised up a little bit, and then, then I got my rear end beat just about off of me, and I was willing to say about anything. Uh, I, was, I, was, uh, I was upset because I got caught. I wasn't sorry that I rode the calf. And I told my dad, I said, listen, you remember the time that you, you laid into me about riding that calf? And I told you I was sorry. Well, I lied. I really wasn't. And if we could go back, I'd do it again. Yeah. Repentance is not riding the calf and getting caught and you're sorry because you got caught. Repentance is when you realize and know that you've sinned in the eyes of Almighty God. You have broken His heart. And when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you know that you've sinned. See, we have, we have, we've watered down everything in our generation to make sin not appear to be too bad. When somebody does something, we, we've come up with different terms to water that down to make it not seem like it's so bad or to take the guilt off of the person that has committed that sin. We've done that. And so in our minds, well, I really didn't do that, nothing that bad. Is that what you're thinking? When the Holy Spirit's going, you know what, you, you shouldn't have thought that or done that. Repentance doesn't come from the heart of somebody that's Oh my, God just saw that. Uh, I guess I better go, go confess that real quick. And uh, maybe tomorrow, if, if he's not looking, I'll do it again. Amen. That's not godly sorrow, is it? Confession is whenever the Holy Spirit convicts you. You have to have the Holy Spirit speaking to you and telling you that it's wrong. And whenever he does... Don't go running to your neighbor. Hey, uh, is this really wrong? Amen. When the Holy Spirit convicts you, then that is the time that he's wanting to draw you into that intimate fellowship with the Father. So second of all, we need to repent. Confession comes first. Lord, I'm sorry. Repentance takes the active work of the Holy Spirit to empower you to overcome what it is that you are guilty of sinning. This is what Joshua told the children of Israel. Now therefore, fear the Lord, serve Him in sincerity and truth. And this is repentance. He says, put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. He says, get away from that. Get rid of them. That way there's no longer a temptation to you. Amen? Amen. If, if something is causing you to sin, get rid of it. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 through 12, Paul is uh, reminding or, or telling the, the, the church in Corinth about why he was, it was necessary for him to send this letter to the church. They were, they were guilty of sin, so uh, the Holy Spirit moved upon the Apostle Paul and says, write this to the church in Corinth and address the sin that's going on there. So in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 8 through 12, Paul is rehearsing to them about the letter that he had wrote to them that caused repentance. Listen to what he says, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, 
I don't regret it. Though I did regret it, it, made, it broke Paul's heart that he had to sit down and address sin in one of the churches that he was establishing and strengthening. He said, it did, I did regret that I had to write it, for I perceived that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Verse 9 says, Now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to what? You stopped doing it. You turned from it. You started living a strong and godly life. For you were made sorrow, uh, sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. In other words, you were going to only get gain by repenting from your sin. For godly sorrow produces Repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted of, but the sorrow of the, the, of the world produces death. For observe this very thing that you sorrowed in a godly, godly manner, what diligent it produced in you, uh, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication, in all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Therefore, although I wrote it to you, I do, I, I do it not, I did not do it for the sake of him who had done the wrong, nor for the sake of, uh, of him who suffered wrong, but that uh, our care for you in the sight of God might appear to you. Being truly sorry for what you did rather than being caught is what will produce repentance. Do you need to repent this morning? Is there sin in your life that you need to repent of? If you're not a Christian, if you've never been born again, I'm going to encourage you to repent of your sin. Allow the blood of Christ to come in and cleanse you from all of your sin, and you'll become born again. Last of all, after we remember and we repent, then we need to resolve. That's what Joshua showed in this, this uh, passage of Scripture. After we remember and repent, we need to resolve in our hearts that through God's grace and power that we are going to walk with Christ more passionately and determined than ever. But I need to warn us that it's not just lip service, that God is requiring from us, but God requires our hands and feet to back up our lips. Amen? Amen. Once we remember and we repent, God requires our feet to back up our words. On, the other, on a side note, don't say if the Lord wills concerning serving Him, because it is, his, it is His will for us to serve Him. Well, if it's the Lord's will, I'll serve Him. No, that's an incorrect statement. It is God's will for us to serve Him. Joshua 24, 15 through 25 says this, Now if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether it be the gods on the, uh, your, uh, your father served on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That's resolution. That's being resolved. So the people answered and said, Far be it from us that we should forsake the Lord and serve other gods. For the Lord our God is he who brought us uh, and our fathers up from the land of Egypt, from the house of bondage, who did great signs in his sight and preserved us in all the way that we uh, went among the people uh, through whom we passed. And the Lord drove out from before us all the people, including the Amorites who dwelt in the land. We also will serve the Lord, for he is our God. Verse 19, Joshua said this. But Joshua said to the people, you can't serve the Lord, for He's a holy God, He's a jealous God, and He will not forgive your transgressions or your sins if you forsake the Lord and serve foreign gods. In other words, He says you can't serve the Lord and serve these foreign gods together. Then He will turn and do you harm and consume you after He's done you good. And all the people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves, that you have chosen the Lord for yourselves to serve Him. And they said, we are witnesses. In other words, they said, we have made up our mind we're going to serve Him. And Joshua says, you can't serve Him if you still intend on serving these other gods. 
And they said, we're not going to serve him. We're going to serve the Lord. Now therefore, he said, put away the foreign gods which are among you and incline your heart to the Lord God of Israel. Put them away. Whatever it is that's hindering you in your walk from Christ, put that away and determine in your heart that you're going to serve him. The people said to Joshua, The Lord our God we will serve, and his voice we will obey. So Joshua made a covenant with the people. In other words, he made a promise with them that day, and they made uh, them a statute and an ordinance in Sechem. If we are sincere and will keep our eyes fixed upon the Lord and continually draw upon the unending streams of his mercy and grace and strength and wisdom, he will grant us everything that we need uh, to live a successful and a victorious life in the upcoming year. Are you willing to take a hold, a hold of this unchanging hand this year? Are you willing to allow him to supply your every need and to give you guidance and according to his will for your life? Are you willing to resolve to commit to God and each other like never before? Are you? If you are, listen to what Scripture says in Hebrews 10, 19 through 25 in closing. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he consecrated for us through the veil that is his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, let us draw near, listen to this, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another to stir up love and good works not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much as the more you see the day approaching. He's coming back. This could be the year. Are you ready? Are you? Father, thank you for the time we've got to spend together. And through your word, you have given us these three challenges that if we will allow you to help us with, we can end up in 2021. <coughs> Resolved. We can end up in 2021 standing firm on the promises of God. Help us to keep our eyes and our hearts fixed upon you because you alone, Father, can give us what we need to live the victorious life that you've promised. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand to your feet as the worship team comes and leads us in a hymn of invitation? Friend, I don't know where you might be in your life. Perhaps you are sitting here and you're under conviction because uh, God has spoken to you about some sin that's in your life. May I encourage you this morning to forsake that sin, put away that and cling to the unchanging hand of God this morning? May I ask you and encourage you to confess that sin and repent and turn from that? May I encourage you, my Christian friend, to remember the goodness of God, how He's blessed you, how He's kept you, how He's promised to continue walking with you? May I encourage you to remember? May I encourage you to stand firm on the Word of God and make a resolution that this year I'm going to walk closer to the Lord than I've ever walked in my entire life. If by the mercy and grace of God, you can do that. Do you need to come this morning as we sing? Do you have a need? Are you bruised and broken and beaten by the world? Do you need to come and allow some healing to take place in your heart? Is there something that you're facing that's bigger than you are and you need the mighty hand of God to move and to give you help 
in grace and mercy in your time of need this morning? Do you need to come? Do you need to come this morning? Have you surrendered everything into the hand of God? Or are there areas in your life that you're withholding for yourself? Do you need to come this morning? Do you need to come? How long has it been since you knelt down and you just said, Lord, thank you for all the blessings that you produced in my life. Lord, I want to thank you and I want to praise you for being good to me. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Have you surrendered all? Would you come? Would you come? Would you come? I wouldn't let another service pass by without surrendering it to the hands of God. pray for just a minute. Well, he's done. All right. Well, thank you folks so much for coming. And uh, if the Holy Spirit uh, spoke to you this morning and you didn't surrender, don't let Satan tell you it's too late. Find just a place somewhere throughout the day and say, Lord, I, I just want to commit my life to you this year like never before. I want people to see Jesus in my life like they've never seen him. When somebody sees my life, I want them to see you. Amen? That's his desire for us. Let's, let's dismiss. Father, thank you for the time we've got to spend together. And thank you for the folks here in the building and the ones that watched over the internet. And I pray your word will continue to resound in our hearts uh, as we go throughout this day and week. I pray that you'd help us to remember all the goodness that you bestow upon us. Help us to remember your might, your power, your strength, your plans. Help us, Father God, to repent whenever we yield to temptation. Lord, I know there's none of us exempt. But Lord, help us not to use that as a crutch either. But whenever you speak to us, Holy Spirit, I pray we'll be quick to fall on our face and repent and to get back up and 
walk that life that you'd have us to walk. Then help us to resolve that we're not going to be found like the average ordinary. But God, we want to be found like you. Bless us, protect us, guide and direct us, we pray in Jesus' name. God's people said. God bless you. You're at liberty to go.